So this morning, we stepped over into a place of prayer, talking about the transition, this time, the sliver of time that we were, are in. And the scripture that I went to in Mark chapter one, I believe we looked first at, um, well, verse six says, John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt on his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey, preached saying, there comes one after me who's mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. Indeed, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then we drop down to verse 14. John was put in prison. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. This is what dad called the sliver of time. And some years ago, he said, we are in the sliver of time. The sliver of time was not the three years of Jesus' ministry. Uh, it began before that. It began with the conception uh, or the announcement of the conception of John the Baptist. Um, but there was, there was a process of things happening that brought that transition time into place. Some years ago, as we, in fact, it was the same time that the Lord spoke that phrase to me about there's something about it when people who know how to use their faith come together to pray. And at the same time, talking about the same meeting that we were about to go to in California, Spirit-led prayer conference. And I made mention of that, I think it was maybe this morning, yesterday, but talking about, I, I was, didn't know if anybody would come, but there was such an anointing on the, the call to prayer it was such a, something that God did that we had a thousand people show up for that meeting. And I mean, they came and they came for the whole thing. That was, it was amazing. But what uh, other thing he said to me, he said, it's time to move things along. And when he said that, I, I had this, um, he made me to know, caused me to know that while the world, it was like, like watching somebody on cross country skis. And so when the world moves things along, you know, there are people, there are people who have agendas, but there are people who yield to devils that have agendas. And when they have that agenda, they start working and they are, they are, um, uh, maybe lack of a better way to say it, they are equipped, called and equipped. They've yielded over to that and they, man, they are in a place, they have yielded to it and they are moving things along. But what I saw when the Lord showed me that in prayer, he said, they're moving things along, but you need to move things along further. And, and, and then, of course, there will be a counter to that. And we've seen it. This was back in 2009. We saw a counter to that and that this and this. And before you know it, there are things happening and we are marching quickly towards the catching away of the church and the, the wrath of God and his judgments. So I wanted to look at just this for just a moment and then we'll pray about that. How are we going to pray? I don't know. I've never prayed exactly about this, this way. It's, it's I'm, within myself, I'm in an unusual place that I haven't sensed before. Um, and, you know, praise the Lord. That's what it's all about, walking by faith. So in, in verse 1, it said, John, I mean, excuse me, Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Did you know that the coming of John the Baptist was included in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That tells us that it was necessary. He was necessary. That call was necessary. And what John the Baptist did was necessary. It was so necessary that there was someone who prepared, more than someone, who pre uh, prepared the way for his arrival. Malachi, we back up a little bit and we go over to Malachi chapter three, it's a couple of books back, the end of our Old Testament, Malachi three. 
Verse one, behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So, uh, and the Lord reminded me of something else too today. He said, you know, this is scripture. It is scripture. It's the inspired word of God, but there were people involved. It was people that said this. These words didn't just, there's only on a few tiny little occasions where we had the voice of God heard apart uh, than through a man, a mouth of a person. And so this person, Malachi, in this case, he was preparing the way. Was preparing the way. What would we call that? What were his words? Those words were divine utterance, divine utterance. They were, they, they were words, not just inspired by, but directly imparted to Malachi from God, equipping him with a grace that allowed him to recognize those words, speak those words. And with that divine utterance, he put things into motion that were working from that point forward to produce exactly what he said. We can see it also then in Isaiah chapter 40. I want you to see something here as we talk about this and then we'll we'll pray shortly. So Isaiah is written, there are several set, three sections to Isaiah. Uh, The first section is about, let's see if I remember right, it's the condemnation of the nation. Number two, the confiscation of the nation. But number three is the comfort. And this chapter 40 through the end of the book is considered the messianic portion of Isaiah. Now you can find Jesus on every page of the Bible, but this is specifically talking about him and it says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem, cry out to her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. Crooked places shall be made straight. Rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I want to look at a couple of things here in this. First of all, it starts off with comfort. Yes, comfort my people. So when he says this, He is speaking words that then the everything else that he has to say following that are, they are embodied or imbued with comfort. Everything from chapter 40 on is about comfort. God's comfort to Israel, which was, was and is Jesus, the redeemer, the redemption, the cross. It's all in here in Isaiah. Then he says, you speak, now you speak comfort to Jerusalem. Now what's he beginning to have a picture of? We see, we go down in verse three, we recognize this, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, but it starts before that. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. That was as much what John the Baptist began to do. It's not just this verse. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to her. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. So John the Baptist, this, we know that his message didn't necessarily say that. He didn't go around saying, prepare the way of the Lord. We don't have any record of him saying that. But what did he say? He said, I am that voice of the one who's crying in the wilderness. In other words, everything I have to say is preparing the way of the Lord. All of his sermons, everyone that he was talking to, we see in other, uh, other 
I believe it's in Matthew, talks about all the different groups that he spoke to. He spoke to the tax collectors. He spoke to the military. He spoke to the political realm. He spoke to the religious realm. He spoke to families. He, he spoke to all, all different ranks and levels of people. And he had such an anointing on him. What was it doing? He was bringing comfort, but the comfort came through pardon and pardon came as a result of repentance. And he said, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hurry up, get ready for it. The answer has come. And he says there is double, double for all her sins. She's received from the Lord's hand, double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, double for her sins. You know, there are all kinds of speculations and commentaries on what that means, double for her sins. Some say double punishment. Well, that's not the nature of God, but he's not unjust. He don't, he won't punish you twice as much as your sin uh, equaled out, but he doesn't do that. Some say, well, it was this, what he says right here. It was, it was pardon and it was um, the warfare is ended and iniquity is pardoned. Well, it could be that. Some say it was the double uh, ca uh, captivity, the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. Well, okay, maybe so. But you know what I see in it? I see John the Baptist and Jesus. I see right here in this, this voice of this one, this prophet saying, hey, what's he doing? He is speaking words and these words are not, don't think about just words of prophecy, but these words are divine utterance and they, the words themselves are making way for the prophet who will step into those words. He stepped into the anointing and it took those words to bring together the, mo the mother and the father, the mother and the father, the mother and the father, all those years to produce John the Baptist who came. I mean, he was anointed from the beginning and he stepped out. He stepped into the anointing of those words, picked up on those words and began to do what those words said. He comforted Jerusalem. He comforted Israel and at his comfort, was not in announcing himself. His comfort was in saying, get ready because there's one coming right on my heels that's worth more to you than I am. He got put in prison and what happened? Jesus stepped right on, on uh, where John the Baptist had been speaking. What did he do? He stepped into his words. He stepped into the exact same divine utterance. And he started off with the exact same words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said the exact same thing as John the Baptist. Stepped over, he just stepped into those words. Jesus, now I don't know that we'll do this um, tonight. Maybe we'll do it tomorrow morning. But I want to show you in scripture to uh, how Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and how this, this separation unto God that happened and, and the power of words, both words full of doubt and words full of faith and how they played into this coming of Jesus until he stepped over into those words that John the Baptist had stepped into. So I think we'll just stop right there. I, I wanted you to see this. Well, I said we'll stop there. Let me, in, lot of, in um, Ephesians chapter six, Krista, Ephesians six in the Amplified, there's a, after Paul said, he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might in verse 10. And he goes through the whole armor of God. He says, putting on the, the uh, uh, whole armor of God so that you can stand against the strategies and the deceitfulness of the devil. Jesus said the single greatest earmark of this age is deceitfulness, is being deceived. He said, so don't be deceived. Well, if you're not going to be deceived, you better work really hard at knowing the truth. And Jude tells you how to do it, but we won't talk about that right now. So... He says, you're going to have to ma master these principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places by ha standing, having done all to stand, stand with your loins girt with the truth, 
That's, that's the foundations of the Word of God, the truth. Jesus said that Word's truth. And then having the breastplate of righteousness, know it, don't come graveling and begging and, and not, only, don't not, not only be the righteousness of God because it's what He's made you, but let the righteousness of God on the inside show up and work on the outside. Live on the outside like you are on the inside. Church, quit living like the world. Church, wake up. The, way, the world's going to hell. And you can't bring them out of hell when you stink just like they do. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Heaven, then he said, put on this breastplate of righteousness. Hallelujah. Live like who you are and who he made you to be. Stand fast in your feet prepared with the, the gospel of peace. Lift up over all the shield of faith. Praise God. Take the helmet of your salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now watch, it's very interesting to me that this is the last piece of the armor that we recognize as armor. The sword which the spirit wields, that's the sword, that's the word that the spirit anoints for the occasion. You should have your heart so full of the word, your loins, your inner man, everything else should hook and hang on that belt of truth. You're just putting it, you're listening, you're putting it in there, whether it seems like something you need to know or not, you're just putting it in there. But then there comes a time when you draw your sword. And the scripture says that, the, that there's a sword in Jesus' mouth. That's where the sword comes into play. Everything we've been hearing already this week, let the sword of the Spirit come out of your mouth. That's the word which the Holy Ghost puts in your mouth for the moment. And it could be a thus saith the Lord. It could be the, the word says, this uh, Matthew says, Galatians says, the uh, scripture says, or it could be the unction of the Holy Spirit. It's the sword. It's the weaponry of the Holy Spirit. It's the sword which He directs. It's the word which He directs. It's the way He directs. It's the unction He directs. It's the, it's the, the equipping and the anointing. But He doesn't quit there. It's not the end of the sentence. He says, uh, you take up the sword of the Spirit praying. Take up the sword of the Spirit praying. Take up the sword of the Spirit, praying at all times in the Spirit. What can we, what's our takeaway there? Get over into prayer in order to undo the works and the deceitfulness of the devil, to stay over in a place of enlightenment with your loins girt about with the truth. And then uh, in, in that prayer that's in the Spirit, let the Holy Spirit draw the Word of the living God out of your heart, put it in your mouth, and do something with it. Do something with it. Praise the Lord. So praying with all manner of prayer and then and, and entreaty or supplication, meaning there are prayers. It doesn't matter if it's a bless this food because I got to eat it prayer or it's a prayer that you are got to move over into a place with a depth of intercession because what you value, something you value, there's a, a something trying to take it away. Take it away from you. Take it away from someone you love. You get over into a place and you let the Holy Ghost bring the unction of the Spirit up and out of you, anointed by Him, praying at all times with all manner of prayer, praying in behalf of the saints of God. Your prayers affect the whole church. And pray for me also. Pray for the ministry. Pray for the preacher. Pray for the ministry. That freedom of utterance, what Jeremy said today, freedom, free flow of freedom, a freedom of speech may be given to me so that I would open my mouth and proclaim it so boldly so uh, confidently that I'll find those words on the inside. I've been in prayer sometimes, been in places of prayer, and all of a sudden words start coming up in me. I say, whoa, I don't know if I can say those because the weightiness of them, I sense the weightiness of it. Lord, give me chapter and verse before I, I say those words. And, and then I get that chapter and verse and out they would come, glory to God. 
and there are words that need to be said in, under the anointing, most particularly the prophet's anointing. But under every, under every ministry gift, there are words that need to be said under an anointing that only can come, not through just the prayers of the minister, but through the prayers of the saints who are praying and, 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 and bringing out that divine utterance. And it had the same effect in the second coming of the Lord that it had in the first coming of the Lord. Hello. Okay, come up here, come up here. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we yield ourselves, Lord, to this work of the Spirit as we pray for divine utterance, Lord, for in the body of Christ, divine utterance in our prayers, divine utterance for Brother Copeland and all of those that are ministering this week under his anointing, under the grace that is on him as a prophet called of God, a seasoned prophet, a prophet of a very high order, that Lord, under that anointing, every minister, every musician, every singer, all operating under that gift and calling the grace of that anointing to speak words and with divine utterance, Lord, words that change things, words that undo and unwrap the, the deceitfulness of the devil, words that unwrap uh, the strategies of the devil, words that bring light, words of instruction, words of correction, words of impartation, words that produce a divine revelation, and that revelation ignited in the hearts of men and women will bring an impartation of the glory and the grace of God. We praise you, Father, that this very moment, this very moment, Lord, that in all of this room and watch it all across the world, people are praying under the divine leadership of the Holy Spirit, drawing out the sword of the Spirit, speaking words of faith, words of the Spirit, divine words from heaven, words in the Spirit, of the Spirit. And Father, we seek you. We seek you, Lord, for your, your guidance, your counsel, for revelation knowledge. We seek you, Father, for that our eyes would be opened and flooded with light so that, Lord, we would see and know and comprehend the, the hope of your calling and the great hope of your coming. That, Lord, we're not blinded. We're not ignorant of the devil's devices, nor are we ignorant of the workings of God in this hour. Oh, I thank you, Father, that the church is rising. We are rising in a, there's an awakening unto God. We are awakening in holiness, awakening in righteousness, awakening, awakening to the power of God that's within us. I thank you, Father, that our eyes are open, flooded with light, so that we could know and comprehend the, 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 the riches of your glorious inheritance, the riches of our inheritance, our inheritance, our inheritance, what we have from you. Oh, thank you, Lord, the master, the master, the master, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I thank you for that. And I thank you, sir, that our eyes are opened and flooded with the light of the glorious gospel so that we can comprehend and understand the immeasurable, the unlimited and surpassing greatness of your power that's in us and for us because we believe. We are believers. And that power's at work in us, doing the work that only you can do, so that we will do the work that only we can do with your anointing on us. Praise God. We thank you for that. It's that same power. It's the same power. And that is the working of your mighty strength that you demonstrated when you raised Jesus from the dead and you seated him at your own right hand in the heavenly places. 
You gave us a seat with him. We are seated at the council table of the Most High. We are seated. We have a seat in the courtroom of the Most High. We are welcomed at the, at the very throne of the Most High. And we thank you for that, Father, that our eyes are open to it in Jesus' name. How we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you for this. Oh, we give you thanksgiving, Lord. Hallelujah. And that you have placed him. Lord, all things are under his feet. I thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for that, Jesus. And you gave him a name. The name which is above every name. That name which is above all principality. Which is above all rule and authority and power and dominion. I thank you for that, Lord. And that, Lord, you have put all things under his feet. And you made him to be the head of the church, the supreme head of the church, over all the church, hallelujah. The church in the earth, the church in heaven, thank you, Jesus, the church in Germany, the church in Russia, the church in Ukraine, the church, Lord, the church in China, the church in Iran, the church in Iraq, the church all across Africa, the church across Canada, the church across Europe, glory to God, the church, glory to God, Jesus is the head of the church. He's the Lord God and director over the church, the commander in chief over the church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he is the head of the church, which is his body. For we are his body. And in this body fills the fullness of him who fills all in all. In this body, in the church right now, our faith, we say it, we believe it. And it's ignited in the church that we are, we are filled with him who com makes everything complete. We are filled with him who fills everything, everywhere with himself. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We're strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And we are head, we, our foot is not turned to the left. Our foot is not turned to the right. But we rise up in our place of great authority. And by faith, we declare that the United States of America will not go the way of the rest of the world, but will go the way, the divine course. We will run the fullness of our course and the plan of God for this nation in the name of Jesus. And the church is rising. The church is rising. The church is rising up, getting up, rising up to be who Jesus said that she is. Oh, we give you praise, Lord. Thank you for that divine utterance. Thank you for the divine flow. Thank you for the divine presence. Thank you for your glory manifest in this place tonight. Swallow up everything, Jesus, that's not from you. Oh, we give you praise for it in the name of Jesus. Can you just give a wonderful hallelujah shout to the Lord? Hallelujah. 